this morning um, on squaring the circle on the road towards a digital circular economy. So today we are going to discuss together what are actually the roles of digitalization in a circular economy. And when I started researching on this concept, I tried to find a good definition of what a circular economy actually is. And I found that there are many, many definitions out there um, from many different actors focusing on different aspects. Um, so, but so that we are all on one page, what we talk about today, I would like to start by just giving you one example of a definition. So basically the circular economy, probably this is not news to you, is thought to closing loops in production and consumption and the main goal there is to reduce waste but also to reduce the use of resources and the natural environment. So um, there is one definition that I would just read to you from the EU. Um, that you can find on their website, and that is the circular economy is a model of production and consumption which involves sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, and recycling existing materials and products as long as possible. In this way, the life cycle of products is, ex is extended in practice. It implies reducing waste to a minimum. Um, they further declare that this is a departure from the traditional linear economic model, which is based on a take, make, consume, throw away pattern. So here again, you see this um, closing the loop logic. Um, so a number of scientists, policymakers, and industries have been arguing that digitalization is also a key component for making the circular economy work. Um, and the idea here is that you use different ICT technologies, you use big data in order to uh, close loops in our economic system. Um, further examples for this are, for example, having more modular and repairable design, um, introducing 3D printing, um, and also tracking consumer goods, for example, with a uh, digital product pass. So this gives you a overview maybe what we're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, so the basic idea of the digital circular economy is to make digitalization work for sustainability. Today we want to find out can this really be attained um, and how can we have a really um, a circular economy that uses digital tools really to keep our consumption within planetary boundaries and also to um, allow a good life for all of us. So, um, now I would like to welcome our guests here and um, I would like each one of you to have a little um, statement. Um, each one gets like five to ten minutes to show their views on the topic and we start by Johanna Sudo. Um, Johanna, welcome. Um, Johanna is a senior advisor for resource policy at the NGO German Watch here in Berlin. Since 2014 she works on circular economy and sustainably mineral supply chains and has been asked several times for advice in, as, expert, uh, as an expert in hearings um, um, and is part of the research commission of the German Environmental Agency. Sorry, I'm reading that out to um, state it right. Um, she's also co-founder and chairwoman of the organization Rundertisch Reparatur um, or Round Table of Repair. Um, Johanna, um, why is the digital circular economy approach an attempt of squaring the circle? What do you think, do you think are the problems? Um, can you hear me? Is it right? Yeah. Uh, well, I think a circular economy is crucial, so we really can... Hmm? It's not can working? You? Yeah, now it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, circular economy is a very crucial concept to actually reduce our resource consumption and our... Um, it's not on. Um, a circular economy is a very uh, crucial concept to actually uh, try to reduce our raw materials consumption. And it aims at uh, keeping the raw materials we have in smartphones and whatever uh, as long as possible within the circle, the use circle. And to reuse it and, um, and by this we can reduce the need for primary resources. And that's crucial because we know, due to a lot of uh, different uh, um, um, yeah, movements at the moment and dynamics at the moment, the, uh, um, the demand for raw materials is increasing immensely. And at the same time, um, 
we know that the impact of uh, raw materials extraction is um, yeah, immense. And we have, um, even if we would say that maybe the raw material as such is not scarce, we know that at many places where there is the extraction of raw materials, there's a huge scarcity of uh, access to water and land. And we know also that the ore within the rocks is getting less and less concentrated. So for every uh, raw materials we extract, we need to get deeper and deeper, dig deeper and deeper with more mining waste uh, being thrown on fields of farmers, with more water having to be consumed and with more um, uh, human rights abuses. And already know the raw materials and the extractive sector is one of the sectors uh, overall with the most human rights abuses. Um, for example, I just came, I came back from a, a field trip to Latin America and there in, uh, in Chile uh, where there's a lot of copper extraction, people don't have uh, access to um, yeah, natural water uh, resources anymore at many places of extraction and for, in Peru people have heavy metals in their bloods uh, leading to cancer and uh, miscarriages. And even, for example, in Peru, I think it's a quite strong example to see that people have been... Um, protesting and demonstrating for the rights to keep their livelihoods and instead of finding a solution for it, often the protests are only shot down and the laws have been changed in a way so it's possible to go um, with arms against the protests and the people shoot uh, the police doesn't even uh, yeah, uh, get uh, any penalties for it, uh, which was called as the license to kill. Um, because the problems, um, there's already a limit and people say we don't want any more extraction and doesn't bring the development we want to us. Um, and at the same time, uh, yeah, so we really need to reduce our raw materials extraction and this is by, by this we really need to see, we have to think circular economy circ uh, really holistically. For example, in Germany at the moment, most legislative processes uh, see circular, circular economy very limited. They only look at the recycling part, at the waste management part, but don't, the most legislative proposals don't think circular economy really holistically, it's thinking of how can we reduce the goods we use, how can we repair more, how can we reuse more, how can we already design products in a way that we uh, can use them longer time. And then only if it doesn't work any, uh, uh, in any other manner anymore, we go towards the recycling. And I think digitalization actually has a big potential to uh, increase and to, yeah, it could uh, facilitate a circular economy. It could by providing, by being able to track materials in supply chains in an easier way. It could facilitate uh, sharing model models, for example, in the sharing economy. But at the same time, we see that it needs a lot so it actually happens um, to have a positive impact. And for example, if you look at sharing models, a lot of and the sharing economy is seen as one solution which could actually um, help us to use um, less raw materials and to use them more efficiently. efficiently. But we see there's a huge risk for rebound effects and to really have sharing models um, fulfilling the goal to um, also um, yeah, facilitate a circular economy. economy. Um, the sharing model has to thought, really think circular economy the whole lifespan of the product until the, all, all from the production until the use phase, until the after use phase in a circular, circular way and that's often not done. And also many of the sharing models actually benefit from a data economy, they benefit from using and getting more data and this has the impact that they often are rather instead of creating stable business models which would be important to, um, to, have, um, to have a sharing economy that actually goes towards long lasting products and um, that are not only used for some time and then um, taken out of this um, sharing model again um, and to really look that we, in, in overall, we use less products. Um, we would need that yeah, stable system at the, and the data economy, which often is often the driving, uh, driving force behind the sharing models, goes often rather for data and for more users instead of trying to um, have less um, people using, uh, having a more intensive um, 
a more intensive use of the products. So we really have to look in carefully into these mod models to see that they really can um, uh, facilitate and promote uh, the, re um, the reduction of raw materials. And this also implies, for example, service um, yeah, that repair is involved, remanufacturing is involved in all this, and that not products are used in a sharing model, and then after some time they're just going to secondary market or taken out again, and then we haven't won anything. So we have to look carefully um, at the models, how they're built, and at the same time we also have software as one issue that is essential to digitalization, and which could be used in a very positive way, but it also in, in uh, yeah, includes a lot of risks. For example, often at the moment, software is used, for example, in smartphones to block certain parts um, to use software so they can't get repaired by everybody. So you can't repair certain, uh, you can't take certain, uh, you can't repair your phone on your own anymore because it's blocked by software. So it's rather instead of being used to use the products longer, it's, uh, it's used always with the argument of security, it's used to inhibit uh, repair. And it facilitates, software facilitates uh, the monopolization of repair by producers. And we know that it's crucial that it's not only the producers who repair uh, the products because we know in the long run it's them the business models are like that, that they mostly want to bring new products on the market instead of um, having, yeah, uh, really benefiting repair. And we need competition on the repair market. And if only in the afterwards, only the producers themselves can repair in the long run, repair can disappear. Um, yes, so we have, and also what we all see, software updates are crucial. And yes, and otherwise often products can't be used anymore. So software plays an important role and has to be, uh, regulated in a way that we can actually benefit from it. And one other issue within digitaliz digitalization is that um, electronics are just is just spread out everywhere. There's RF, there are RFID tags plugged into uh, clothes, into whatever. Everything that can become smart to be tracked, to be controlled. But by that we have little part, little pieces of raw materials everywhere in clothes, with, which then afterwards are just dispersed and we can't um, gain them, uh, put them into res uh, onto the, yeah, we gain them again for a circular economy. They're just lot lost out of the circle. And even already now, we know that from smartphones, for example, only 30% of the smartphones are collected. And then even in a very high technical recycling, not even half of the um, materials and metals that are in a smartphone currently are actually recycled and regained for the cycle. So already now, already in smartphones, which is quite a big <laughs> chunk already, well, there's a lot of small parts in there, but um, already there we know that um, the regaining of materials is very difficult and it will become more difficult if you have um, electronics spread out everywhere. Yeah, so in general, we know, we see that there is quite some challenges to make the circular economy being a driver within a digitalization or digitalization being a driver for circular economy. Um, and for that, we really have to look closely at the risk and the potentials and have to look uh, for a regu regulatory frame. And that means, for example, we have to look at market concentration, we have to look at data economy, and we have to uh, design the products in a way that we can use them a long time. And we really have to make sure that the dig digitalization doesn't lead to more market um, uh, put, uh, concentration and, for example, a monopole of, from producers on the products and the repair and the whole um, use of the, life, uh, of the product within the life cycle. cycle. And by that, we can, uh, there is a huge risk that to be repair, we lose the whole repair market. Thanks a lot. Vivian, kannst du mal fragen, weil das ist brutal anstrengend mit der Technik irgendwie. Das ist laut, das halt, das um, halt extrem. We're just having a little technical issues. I think that's how it's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> um, so, thank you very much, Johanna. You gave us a really nice introduction. Um, now, as our second guest, I would like to welcome Andrea Cardoso. Um, she's a professor in the Business and Economics Faculty of the University of Magdalena Santa Marta in Colombia. Um, she did her PhD in environmental studies and Andrea's research addresses the political ecology of the global coal chain 
uh, just transition and climate justice. Um, Andrea, first of all, please tell us a little bit about your work and how you would say it relates to the circular economy debate. And also we would be interested in what you think how the Global South could actually profit from a digital circular economy or where maybe it doesn't profit so much. Okay. Uh, I hope that you listen to me, I think, yes. So, first of all, thank you for having me here. Thank you to all the voluntaries uh, that have been working these days so hard in this such a big uh, um, event or uh, conference. Uh, I have been in many of the panels. I have learned a lot about digitalization. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to join you in the discussion and also I really appreciate that the organization brings the, uh, diversi diversified points of view of digitalization. So, uh, as you said, uh, my research focuses on a study the cold chain between Colombia and Germany. Uh, what I, uh, I focus on a study is uh, to trace the coal because Colombia, um, my country, is the fifth uh, world largest coal exporter in the world. Many of the coal comes, from, to, comes to, to Germany and to Europe and in every step of the coal change, the, this uh, process uh, left behind a lot of environmental and social impacts that we call it social environmental liabilities. And we need to take into account these liabilities in the circular economy. So my work is dedicated as a professor. I dedicated to empower young students uh, to research and work in just transition in the Caribbean region of Colombia, where the coal is extracted. And many of my students come from, uh, the, their families come from where the land has been impacted by uh, coal mining. Uh, the land has been impacted through air, soil, and water pollution. And uh, all the coal that is extracted in this region is for exportation. Uh, when a ton of coal of Colombia uh, is, um, is exported to, to Germany and as well to Europe. This, uh, to produce energy for digitalization, uh, this ton of coal or this energy itself carries um, this air, soil, water pollution that is producing in the lab, in the land of my students' families. So we need to, to, to think uh, the circular economy as a system uh, perspective to look all the impacts in the whole uh, process of the, the circular economy. Uh, uh, the, always the material and energy uh, that requires for this digital circular economy uh, is, uh, is complemented. I mean, for this digital uh, circular economy, you need uh, raw materials, but as well energy. And we need to question with these raw materials as minerals and energy, where is they come from? And what are the impacts that they produce when we extract this uh, source of uh, material of energy? And, and because the, uh, the term thermodynamics law and the entropy laws, uh, it takes a lot of energy and as well material to reuse uh, in a circular economy. Uh, and as well, it's supposed that the circular economy, uh, the digital circular economy comes from renewable energy. But we, in a, we are in the middle of the energy crisis because the war between Russia and Ukraine. And this crisis showed us, at least showed to the world, that Ger Germany is not prepared for the, for the renewable energy. You are depending so much of gas, and as well you are importing, you are starting to, to increase the importation of coal from, from Colombia. And this 
digital uh, circular economy is fueled with uh, this coal, and this coal is leaving so, so much impacts in the land where I come from. Um, so the idea of the circular economy, I think maybe uh, Andrea is going to talk about the challenges to how to decrease the use of co uh, the use of material and uh, uh, energy that fuel this uh, digital circular economy. I'm going to stop there, and maybe I will later I will do more examples. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, I think it's good to always remember that um, it's not only about resources, but the whole digital system is also very dependent on energy. Um, so now I'm quite curious. We, our next guest is um, joining us, us online. So um, that seems to work, great. <laughs> uh, welcome, Almut Nagel. Um, Almut Nagel is working in the European Commission, D Directorate General for Communications um, Networks, and sorry. She's a policy officer in the field of green digital transformation and works, among other things, on the European Digital Product Passport as part of the proposed eco-design for sustainable product regulation. She also works with businesses of the European Green, New, Green D Digital Coalition towards methodologies to measure the net environmental impact of ICT solutions. Um, so, uh, Amut, I think you brought a little presentation with you and we're all really curious to get to know more about the Circular Economy Action Plan and what you are uh, working on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks a lot. I do hope you hear me uh, fine. Um, as you already said, uh, Vivian, I work with DG Connect. From my background, I'm rather an environment person. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, very good. Um, from my background, I'm rather an environment person, and in my former life, I was doing a lot of social economy, so things come back together in a lot nice way. I'm very happy to be part of the panel today because it comes timely, and yes, the, the increase of demand is something we need to look at, but also with the overall crisis with the Ukraine and uh, made aware of the dependencies can be on energy or on materials, really need to um, bring forward a new approach to this, and the resilience has become, uh, let's say, much more important in those uh, last months. So, social economy is, uh, if you would uh, ask me where would I see in all the sectors the advantage of digital to um, go further into uh, carbon re reductions or material reductions, etc. It for sure would be in the circular economy. The first slide shows the European Green Deal that was issued as the programmatic policy program of the van der Leyen Commission in uh, December 2019. And uh, you see it's a very broad, uh, let's say it covers a lot of different areas from climate to justice, to pollution, to farm to fork and uh, one of which is mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy. So this is one of the big pillars driving forward the European Green Deal um, in total. Um, the next slide um, shows you the Circular Economy Action Plan that is, let's say, one more specific um, activity under the European Green Deal. It was issued in March 2020, and you see three main pillars. The green one says, make sustainable products the norm in the EU. So this is the overarching goal. It's about uh, empowering consumers and public buyers, but it's also about um, making clear to producers what the role would be in production processes. Um, it has been chosen uh, areas, now I go to the, the red one, um, sectors where the potential for circularity is highest. And this is electronics and ICT. It has already been touched upon batteries, vehicles, but also pa uh, packaging, plastics, textiles, 
construction and buildings because they use a lot of material, but uh, it also, once it's used, it stays there for a long time, food, water, and nutrients. And the overall uh, orientation is also to reduce waste, to reduce waste exports, and to boost market for secondary raw materials. On the uh, right-hand side, uh, you will see what, uh, let's say, are elements to be looked at. And it's really about making circular economy work for people, planet, and um, entities on the ground. The next slide shows you, let's say, the uh, overall understanding that it's when we talk about um, circular economy, it's not only about um, the, the greenhouse gases and uh, material uh, reduction in the product itself. It looks at the whole picture. So it's about fuels, it's about the natural impact, it's about mining, it's about soil, water, which is needed. So it has already been said, we need an impact uh, decoupling and uh, we, we need to look beyond the economic, uh, let's say, uh, benefits into ecological uh, gains and social um, equity. Otherwise, we will never be able to make it. Um, the next slide shows you the package that was brought out in um, this March. It's called the Sustainable Products Package, which is kind of the logic um, for the development of the, um, the Circular Economy Action Plan. It included a strategy for sustainable and circular textiles, new rules to empower consumers for the green transition, um, the support for uh, circular business models. And uh, there are, um, let's say at 12 o'clock, you will see complementary sectoral rules, for example, for construction and other categories, batteries, chemicals, packaging. This is coming up. In the middle, you will see the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, which is a um, proposal of the Commission towards uh, Council and Parliament, they already started uh, discussing it um, on making products that are sustainable the norm. Um, this uh, package includes uh, as well um, a digital product passport, and I will go into this uh, for uh, in a second. What I would like to give you also a little bit more of insight is the new roles um, for empowering consumers in the green transition. The aim of this package, which is also a legal uh, proposal uh, in form of a directive, uh, which would translate in German uh, Rahmenrichtlinie, um, is to ensure consumers get adequate information on product durability and reparability prior to purchase. So before you buy it, you will know what you're buying. And it's about uh, strengthening the consumer's protection against unworthy or false environmental claims and premature um, obsolescence. This has already been touched upon. Um, it builds on two uh, legislative um, uh, pro uh, directives that are already out there, Consumers' Rights Directive and Unfair co um, Consumer Practice Directives. So it's it's yeah, putting up to date. Um, other um, uh, things that will happen now it will come out with the with the autumn package is packaging waste review, but also the substantiating green claims, where companies are held to substantiate means explain and make more transparent when they say my product is green. They will be compelled to use joint methods, for example, for the um, product environmental footprinting um, and life cycle analysis so that labels, not just everybody puts out a label uh, like randomly, but they, they really they need to, to be streamlined into a more comparable um, uh, point of view. Um, <clears throat> there are also a review of the um, industrial emissions directive, etc. But what is really interesting that I would like to go into um, 
is uh, the next slide, which is about designing sustainable products. It's uh, a legislative uh, proposal um, that really wants by 2050 to have all products sustainable. And uh, the, the basis is the widening of the Ecodesign Directive, which for the moment when you're at least in Germany or also in, in other um, European countries, you go to buy a fridge or a washing machine, you will have the AA or B plus, whatever um, labels uh, given to it. Um, and this is, let's say, the running Ecodesign Directive uh, right now. This will be enlarged and uh, the has already been said, the need for design criteria will be added, the need for material information will be added. And uh, so it uh, goes f f much further um, than the, the old Ecodesign Directive, which is still in place, just to be cl clear, this is still in place because the negotiations of council and of parliament on the new proposal are ongoing. It will take let's say roughly another year, maybe one and a half until the entry of force and then plus uh, the transposition uh, period. Um, if you would please switch to the next slide, I will just guide you very briefly um, through the um, what is happening under the Eco Designs for Sustainable uh, Products. Um, this is, uh, let's say, a regulation that will aim for a level playing field of all products um, uh, in, in the EU, so for, for um, manufacturers in the EU, but it will also apply to all the um, imports coming to the EU. So here you will see the Eco Design requirements that are listed uh, on your right hand, durability, reliability, reusability, because it's already been said, um, if we need, want to use a product longer, this uh, is, let's say, the best way to ensure less product, uh, less, less material and energy use, because for a lot of products, it's not the use phase that makes the big difference. It's really the production part. For ICTs, it's something like 80% of the overall footprint of a, uh, of a device is within the um, sourcing and the production part. So if we are able to use something more uh, in, in time spans or upgrade it or uh, uh, refurbish it, this would always be preferable to the, let's say, even <laughs> circularly end of life in the sense of bringing it back to a material or, or energetic reuse uh, in the sense of recycling. You will also see performance requirements, so what will be necessary to uh, look uh, how does the, the product need to work? And then uh, the other big pillar is the information requirements to make more visible, um, for example, recycled content, uh, possibility of remanufacturing and recycling. So information on um, repairability, etc. But also if a recycler in the end, he, they need to know what is in in what, let's say, formulation uh, materials are in, how can I possibly recover those materials? Um, and uh, uh, so the, the um, end of life and the waste phase should also be informed about. For a couple of products, there will be the obligation to set up digital product passports. This is something that will still need uh, a little bit of time in order to be developed, uh, to develop the system of digital product passports. What we have for the moment in the regulation is a framework for all this. The first digital product passport is already decided on in the uh, proposal for the batteries regulation. And this will come into force uh, beginning of first, first, uh, first January 2026, the first um, digital product passports for batteries would need to be installed. And we are working with industry on this, uh, with uh, stakeholders in uh, several um, 
big projects in order to collect the information, what would be needed, also touching upon um, intellectual property rights, security issues, how could that system work, let's say, technically, because we want to have a decentralized system, so no central database, it will just be much too big. And to also ensure that with the stepwise approach of including more and more products uh, and uh, having them uh, with digital product passports, this is interoperable because uh, it's of no use if uh, it's distinct systems and um, data from one or the other cannot be um, used. Um, I I think this is close to the end of my presentation. There is another slide on the benefits of the digital product passport. It's about tracking and tracing, but it's also about um, knowing in the end for the market surveillance, uh, what is, uh, where are my products, and how do they look like? Um, and in the end, when it comes to overall um, view for policy setting how much material do we have within the EU and at what stage of life is it in. Um, the next slide uh, we can maybe just skip. It's there on the empowered consumer and public buyers. Um, I'll come back to this as much. The question is still, and it was already touched upon, how much you sell or how much we buy. Um, this is very crucial because it would not help um, the, the planetary boundaries um, secure um, acting space if we have a lot of sustainable products, but just two many of those. Um, the last one is a little bit with a smile. It is very important to be green, but uh, it's also quite uh, difficult for the moment with so much information out there um, to be green. So there's still a lot to, to be done in order to provide information um, at the right spot and not overdo it. With this, um, yes, I would uh, like to give back to the stage and thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we see that it is a, yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems to be a long and intense way towards the circular economy. So um, I already see a lot of discussion points here. Um, we keep them in mind, but first I wanna get back to Andrea Vetter, who is coming um, more from, yeah, various perspectives actually. Andrea um, has, um, for example, occupations such as a transformation researcher, an activist, a teacher, or a journalist also. Um, she works at, on the topics of degrowth, commons, and critical ecofeminism, among others. She's an editor of the popular magazine for transformation, OYA, and fellow of the laboratory for new economic ideas in Leipzig. Um, she's also a co-author of the book The Future is Degrowth and an author of a book called Convivial Technology. And that's actually also what I would like to know from you first. Um, what do you think, how can your concept of the convivial technology relate to circular economy? Does it fit together? Do you think that the circular economy is missing certain parts or how does it fit? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much for having me, I think. Uh, and thank you, Almut, for the talk you give, because I think I can directly go on from that. Like having taught now um, two years at a design institute at the university, um, I'm very much in favor of, of eco-design, of course, but I'm also very much thinking about what you said latest, like there's no use in having all these green products and still have too much of them. Um, and I think here we really have to understand what is meant by convivial technologies to step back and think about um, what kind of stories are here at stake when we talk about a circular economy. And a circular economy is certainly becoming a very mighty story, like as you have seen in a lot of European EU concepts and other concepts, a lot of um, university fundings and so on. Everybody is working with the concept of circular economy and why. I think it is because for most people, as a proverb is going, you might know, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And circular economy is certainly a way to keep up the illusion that we might be able to solve 
the problems we face on this planet um, with um, keeping this capitalist mode of production intact. And it is based on the central myth of decoupling, as was shown also by Almut. Like the idea is to decouple the resource use from the economic growth. And that is a very nice idea. And it happens in a kind of relative decoupling at certain points. We can see it in the industrialized countries for the last decades. Like there's a very slow decoupling in some uses of resources and also in some um, uses of energy consumption. But there is no such thing as an absolute decoupling. It's just physically not possible because there is no such thing as a circular production in total, because to produce something anew, you have to introduce some kind of energy. Um, and it's not possible to create these kinds of total closed loops that we would need to really overcome climate crisis. So, the good thing is there is not only these two possibilities of, on the one hand, there's the old mode of fossil capitalism, and on the other hand, there is the new mode of green capitalism um, functioning within circular economy. But there is also, if you accept that there is ways beyond capitalism, there's also a third option, and that is quite good. Um, there's the possibility to have a kind of a post-capitalist, post-growth, caring economy that functions in a total different way because how our economy functions on markets, that is nothing that is nature given and it has not been there for all the time of humankind. No, I mean, it's just social contracts we are enacting in this kind of environment and we could also do otherwise. So I think at this point now, it's totally important that we allow ourselves to have a much bigger imagination of how things could be. And therefore, I am very happy to be, to be part of a project that is called Roadmap to a Circular Society. That is a um, one and a half year project um, that is working on the, on the fact that if we really want to have more sustainable products, we won't find a techno fix for that. But we have to think about a different kind of society. And that is what the term circular society means. In order to have more, like a bit more of circularity, which is surely possible, as is possible a relative decoupling, we need a much bigger circular literacy, for example, which means that people live together in other ways, that they change their social cultural structures of living together, of being together, of um, doing transactions, maybe outside of markets. Um, so, convivial technology is a lot about finding other kinds of so-called business models and thinking in terms of economy more of the blossoming of economy and not of the ever-growing economy. And as I went up here on this panel, I was thinking a lot about last time I was here on the first Bits and Bäume conference. Um, I was facilitating a panel with Silke Helfrich, who um, unfortunately died quite young last um, autumn, and Silke Helfrich was one of the most important um, researchers on the commons in all of the world, I would say. And that is exactly what we have to think about, like how can we introduce um, other forms of technology in combining them with economic models that base on commons and not on markets and profits. So that is the basic idea of all kinds of free software thinking, of all kinds of open source and open data, um, in a way that is 
<clears throat> thinking about the term digital sovereignty also, because as we have seen, like the idea that in a lot of our products, um, they can be tracked down where they are all the time of their life cycle and then can be recycled in that kind of idea of circular economy, that is also a very big problem if you think about in what world would we live then? Like we would live in a world where all the things around us, for example, this chair or also like the thing, my clothes, my shoes, um, even maybe my pen, do not belong to me and I am not um, the one who can decide whether I want to share it with you because maybe we live together and I say, oh, you can have my pen or my clothes. No, it belongs to a company and the company will take it back at the end of the life cycle and put it mm, and will kind of recycle or refurbish or whatever, do with it. But I don't think that is a world we want to live in, like a world where everything around us is owned by corporations. That is a kind of hyper-capitalism um, and that is the total opposite of the commons, which means we can deliberately decide with whom we want to create um, a community where we want to share our things and that is how we use less things if we share them and if we live together in another way. Let's give some short examples and then I will finish. Do I have the time still? <clears throat> um, I think a lot of hacker spaces are very interesting examples for that. Um, in that there is a collective space where people share knowledge and where people also share um, hardware and means of doing. And it shows that <clears throat> we can like tinker around and create new meanings also with old tech because there's a lot of things already on this planet. The idea that we can build up everything from a new in a green way is a kind of hubris where we want to vanish all the things that are already there, but there is like million, billions, tons of artifacts on this planet that are already there and that could be reused and um, reopened, for example, with other kinds of um, open source software. Another example is um, from the agriculture point, like, um, I think the producing beyond the market is in the agricultural field the most um, developed in the model of community-supported agriculture, which means that people get a share of the harvest of the farmers and share also the risk. They don't buy it with the market, but directly at the producers. Um, <clears throat> And how could we, um, for example, implement in that kind of agricultural production um, also new forms of agro-solar parks that are, um, um, that will be built soon. Um, but also how can we think about using the least um, technological means possible. For example, you can do agriculture also with a horse and maybe not uh, only with a um, digital driven robot, but maybe at some, in some fields a digital driven robot is the very good thing to do, you know, but thinking about technology in a way where is it really needed and where not. It's not like that automatically the more digitalized version is the best, but maybe the other way around. Um, I hope we can go deeper into all the, of these questions later, but I will stop at that point, I think. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to directly give the word to Andrea and Johanna, who maybe want to react on the, both uh, solutions that we've heard now, or ideas. Um, who wants to go first? Okay. So, um, the digital uh, circular economy is still eco-dependent. 
I mean, it's still depending on the, the natural resources. As um, we see, uh, in this eco-dependency, we need to change the values. And what Andrea said, uh, the economy of the commons. So why we are going to reproduce in, the, in a digital circular economy or in a circular economy the same values of the capitalism where the capitalism is producing a lot of uh, damage uh, along the, the different value change. Why not to bring uh, new values, for example, the solidarity, for example, the community work, for example, be aware of, uh, of all the impacts, be aware and also recognize all the impacts uh, that produce what we are using as well. So all the impacts that, uh, impacts that is producing uh, the mobile phones of the internet as well and the, the energy to be, uh, we, many people said we need to, to uh, push the transparency of the circular energy, but it's not, it's not also the transparency, it's, uh, it's to be responsible of those impacts. And as a consumer, we have so much impacts, uh, or so much power to decide what type of energy or to decide what we are going to consume and what, what is our role in this circular economy. Um, and also, I would like to, to ask to the panel, what about uh, the inequalities? How approach the inequalities in, this, um, in, this, uh, in the circular economy? Uh, uh, you know that uh, in the production of energy, uh, the North has their own South, and the South, the so the south uh, uh, has uh, the south of the south. So, in the, how to uh, approach the inequalities in the, in the circular uh, economy? How we uh, mitigate, for example, the climate change? What is the role in the, in the digital circular economy, the mitigation of the climate crisis? And, and how we uh, uh, approach inequalities uh, and as well to the decoup decoupling the use of material and energy. Yeah, I don't know. Um, now maybe you want to answer shortly. How mm -hmm. do the concepts address uh, social justice? Mm, now you should hear me. Um, well, the, the social aspects are very important. Uh, <laughs> To what extent it's already uh, implemented in, in the proposals, this differs a little bit. So the, the idea with all those different uh, approaches is to create an overall network of, um, of things. And I would yeah, like to, to give a word of cautious regulation and legal frameworks are, let's say, in tendency always a little bit rather behind the train than really anticipatory. This is just, the, let's say, the quality, um, how um, decision-making is done. So um, there is a lot of room for, let's say, non-regulated activities, be it by stakeholder groups, be it by consumer protection um, activities, w without pushing any responsibility around. It's, it's just the fact that regulation cannot solve everything and uh, it needs to be clear that uh, regulation is not um, putting more social stress uh, on, on weaker parts of society or the, the global, uh, let's say, um, equilibrium. Um, but I would like also to go back very briefly to Andrea Fetter. I think she really did uh, uh, put, put the finger into where it, it needs to be. Um, Sufficiency is something that starts to be really being discussed also in Brussels, which sounds a bit, uh, yeah, uh, how would I say? Um, it's interesting because 
for a while it was not at all acceptable to talk about uh, sufficiency. Now it came up with the, let's say, um, the sovereignty and the resilience discussion. Um, sufficiency really starts to be an important part. And uh, here it's a very personal point of view. Um, it is, uh, it is really very uh, important. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, products, but uh, more specifically for that panel, we can talk about the digital. We really need to know where we need it and uh, not just put it out because we can put it out. Um, this, is, this will not be helping. And I'm fully uh, with uh, Andrea to, to say for some of the uses and the purposes the old tech might even be better because it's not connected. It has less uh, surface for, for cyber attacks and uh, will run very nicely. Um, uh, it, it needs to be updated and software needs to be still available on those, let's say, older devices. But this is very important where we also need to look at um, and what is very important is that we put digitalization into the service of well-being and planetary boundaries. Um, one thing we really did, didn't yet fully discuss is also uh, where digital can help to shorten um, read, uh, the value chains and uh, maybe make it more regional, where also the, let's say, the identification with the sharing uh, concept that Andrea has put out could be more, let's say, felt for people because in, in global uh, value chains, the sharing might be a little bit more tricky. Um, I would like to give you two quick, um, let's say, references that I really, really appreciate. Yesterday, um, the Digital for Sustainability Network of uh, researchers put out uh, a new... Um, report, uh, Tillman Santarius, which is called Digital Reset. Um, I think it's worthwhile looking into it because it's really about what values do we want to pursue with the digital um, rollout and the de digital uh, development. And the, the commission has put out a strategic foresight 2020 on the twinning of the green and the digital transformation. This might also be of uh, interest for you to show you in what mindset uh, the commission in total, not the individuals, but in total, is when it comes to those two main transformations that uh, are very different in, in their character. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I think, do you need this? <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. And I think what became obvious and I, uh, here yeah, now, it's really an issue about power and social justice, and we really have to make sure that this is not leading in more concentration of power with uh, big corporations, as you pointed out. Having a fancy, uh, fancy name of sharing economy or sharing models, and then behind it's just more concentration of power by big corporates. So I think we really have to be very cautious there, and I think that we really need regulation to make sure that this digital power, which is not often very democratic, is it um, really leads to, uh, yeah, for example, that the sharing model, com a commercialized sharing model doesn't even make all the other more democratic sharing models to vanish because it's just having a bigger access to data and can just, is more, it has it much easier to expand. expand. And um, in this context, I think you would, yeah, I think it's um, very interesting you were saying that the sufficiency debate at Brussels level at the moment is coming in again. And I think we have a big possibility we really have to take now. We see with the um, yeah, Ukraine war, it became obvious that also uh, Germany, in, co in the context of raw materials, is extremely dependent on Russia, but it also, and even much, much, much more, is dependent on China. And that it's very, very risky to be so dependent from countries, um, yeah, from countries, and uh, even before, uh, 10 years ago, though, or even more than that, there was a raw materials initiative uh, um, um, put out by the European Union trying uh, trying to put um, trade measures on China to get access to the raw materials from China. And now I think it's a quite rare moment that we see this is maybe not the best option. We have to really get independent from China. And this circular economy we went can be one way, but we really need to reduce our demand and to see how where we can really reduce the use of our raw materials in the whole circle to get independent, to get more sovereignty. And I think it's a very... 
uh, very moment we really have to uh, take now and see how we can really bring this debate on that we really need to reduce our demand um, and we have to bring this forward at the moment. And uh, in regard to the social aspect, in, I think what the European Commission is doing at the moment, it's quite enormous and it's a lot if you compare it to uh, many other commissions at the moment. When I started with German Watch more than eight years ago, we were already talking about eco-design for smartphones and tablets and nothing happened. It was only in another study, another study, another study. And now finally, eight years ago, we have, uh, eight days later, we have a proposal for eco-design on smartphones. But there, I think, even in this proposal, to become very concrete, there we have a lot of ways where we see the social issue is not taken into account and also the power of digitalization is not really addressed. For example, there is no prohibition of the pairing of uh, the, um, parts, which means the blocking of specific parts in products um, which make repair impossible. And I think all these issues have to be addressed and it's also about access to information, access to spare parts by everybody. And I think there we have to really look into the detail to see that it really will have an impact and that it's not only meant to be good, but that it really um, can uh, have an impact. And just because repair is one of my <laughs> topics I've been working on a lot, uh, we see now at the moment it's the first time we do be talking about the right to repair at the European level. Um, and at the same time, we see repairers, people repairing, actually repairing, are just getting less and less and less because the conditions are so bad and there are no people. Then it could happen in the end, we have a right of repair, whatever this is, because it's quite, um, have a different facets. But, um, and then in the end, we don't have anybody to repair anymore. So something to look at the local level is really to see that we, uh, yeah, also in Germany and all, we really have to support craft to have people repairing and to, uh, yeah, to make it possible that it's not in the end only the corporations being able to repair and they won't do it in the long run. And I think another just looking at the policy dynamics at the moment, there's a great push for a new raw material strategy at German level and also at the EU level. And at the EU level, it's not within the circular in the Green Deal. Oh, it's not, well, it's in the Green Deal, but not within the circular package. There's going to be a raw materials act. And I think we really have to make sure that it goes hand in hand with all the issues um, yeah, taken up in the circular economy package, that it's really seeing circular economy as one possibility to have demand, uh, to um, satisfy the demand on raw materials and they really already there enshrine the issue. How we get our raw materials uh, and enough raw materials for the economy is that we need to reduce our the demand. So it really has to be looked at more holistically and I think there's a chance for it at the moment. Thanks a lot. Um, we in, so that everyone can also participate in the discussion, I think it's high time we include you, uh, the audience. Um, if you would have any questions now, you can raise your hand. There's a microphone going around and you can get prepared. Yeah, there's one question here. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my question will be proceeded with a small case study addressed especially to Professor Diaz but also to the other panelists. I'm from Poland, this is important in this case because we are also a country with a big tradition of the coal mining and our current authoritarian government uh, denied strongly the climate change you know, and invested a lot of money in the coal mining. It was very inefficient, so as a result uh, half of the coal uh, comes from Russia. I mean was coming from Russia, now this source of course is, is, is cut. And, uh, and uh, we did invest in the other source of, sources of energy. And now in the panic, the government is importing coal from Colombia. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, it might be uh, good for your economy for a short time, a short period, because uh, uh, there is a huge demand for coal, so maybe you can you know, get some additional extra uh, kind of income from that. And my question is, there is any chance for you, for Colombia, to avoid the, the, the Polish case and uh, invest this money in something different than coal mining? Because for obvious reasons, this is a source of the past. So you have to find some other like, triggers for, for your economy. And for the other panelists, the question is, do, do we have any ideas how to uh, help in this transition? If we keep this division north-south, so how north can help south in this transition, 
and maybe I mean I'm open for these ideas for something new than the current capitalism, but uh, we probably don't have much time, so we need some ideas that can be used like immediately. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you for um, for your question. Yeah, um, I think the this is a uh, this event is a good opportunity to uh, think about the responsibility in the in the energy terms. As I told you, uh, for for us, the energy crisis ha uh, has been a, like a big surprise, as you said, because the uh, the coal exportation increase and uh, Europe is demanding more coal from Colombia. It's just the, span the expansion of coal uh, is uh, getting bigger. And, and it, this is affecting uh, the communities in the Caribbean coast of Colombia. So uh, the, the study case is important because you, uh, as um, also the panelists talk about the digital circular economy, we see the dig digital uh, circular economy like a cycle, but actually we don't see the whole picture of, of, of that. Uh, where these raw materials come from, and what is these raw materials and the energy uh, in cells come from, and what is the, the what happened there? As uh, as he said, um, and also there is a geopolit geo geopolitical context that uh, make a lot of changes. And we previous to the to the war, uh, we were uh, the decreasing the amount of coal producing of coal, and actually one of the regions, one of the uh, multinational companies decided to no, uh, no export more country from, from that mines, and actually they uh, closed. And we are, uh, 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 we are facing that close of this mine, but as well we're facing at the same time the expansion of, of, of uh, coal mining in another region. And also the expansion of uh, renewable energy in those regions, because this uh, is in the Caribbean of, uh, of Colombia, and we have uh, a lot of potential in coal reserves, but as well a lot of potential in renewable energy. So this is a, a mix of energy there, and also I, I want to, to raise that uh, for the digital um, economy, uh, we need energy. And as we see, uh, it seems that the governments and the polit in, the, in Europe and as well in uh, South America, it tries to diversify their source or energy, but uh, through coal, uh, oil, through uh, renewable energy, but it's not changing the system. It's not, uh, and also it's not reducing the amount of energy that they, they, they use. So even if we uh, leave the fossil fuels, I mean the energy transition is not only leave the fossil fuels in the ground, uh, means a lot of more for, for the, uh, for the uh, people in, in Colombia, means uh, dignify the lives of, uh, of the communities there. And even with the uh, renewable energy, we still are producing impacts in the regions, displacement of communities, because the renewable energy uh, needs a lot of land for producing the, the same amount of energy that produces a ton of coal. And, and now, because the coal prices is so high, uh, actually now we have a new government who is, uh, is trying to, to promote in the just transition, try to, uh, uh, to make a, a, a energy transition in our country. But the problem is we have a lot of contrast with these multinational companies that are exporting to, to uh, Poland and to Germany. So what uh, we are trying to do is uh, 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 to export, try to uh, make that these companies export the country, the, the coal, not from uh, new mines, but from the, the, the same mines, because the uh, coal prices is so high that they can continue to extract the coal in the same mines. Uh, that's why we try to, to, to uh, 
yeah, to fight that no, the no expansion of the more mines, more coal mines due to the energy crisis in here, the geopolitics of the energy crisis. Thanks. Um, I just pass over to, I think it, Andrea was addressed. Uh, I, I, I want also, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I, I also want to address that I think the circular economy is a, is a good tool, but I need, uh, should be a complementary to uh, the study of uh, the value of change. I mean, the knows where is the raw materials come from, and as well the life cycle of these of these materials. So the digital needs to work more in the life cycle and the value of change. So that would be one first um, fast track solution. So look more at value chains. Any other suggestions? I mean, the second question was, what can we do right now? What would be um, the things we have to focus on? And because um, the question was, uh, we cannot stop capitalism right now. Are there any more concrete things that are that have to be done today? That how we can make economy more circular without, as not only relying on system change. I mean, you can answer, but maybe also someone else. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's a very big question. <laughs> I think one thing that you mentioned is that um, the focus on techno fixes is maybe not the fastest way to reduce consumption, use, and waste. Um, so I was thinking about um, maybe solutions that go less into the direction which next digital innovation can we find, how complex can we make a product pass that it has all the information, but rather shifting our focus to social innovations, different ways of business models. Um, are there any ideas there that come to maybe all of our minds also? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're... Um more interested in depth in this, you can also read in our new book, The Future is Degrowth, <laughs> that we have like a whole array of um, strategies how to um, go on in the struggle for other economic forms. And like we stress basically three interlinked strategies, like the one would be creating more nautopias, more places where we can um, we can try out other forms of living together. There's also this whole discourse about um, real labore in Germany, like real world laboratories. And I think we need a lot, a lot, a lot of them. For example, like all kinds of repair cafes, of, for example, the Otellos, the it's open technology laboratories in the rural areas, um, all kinds of hacker spaces, all kinds of community supported everything, um, economic models. Um, <clears throat> but we also need, um, like, of course, institutional reforms. And I thought of, as you were talking about, um, the ability to um, be able to repair things. I mean, one big problem in that is that our current tax system in Germany, but also in a lot of other countries, is taxing labor so much more than resources, so that basically repairing things in a professional way um, is not profitable and is not manageable. And so, for example, thinking about a massive tax reform in that way, thinking about taxing labor less or especially combining it with um, common f commoning forms. So you could think about labor um, or people that work for non-for-profit associations, people that work for corporations, for example, um, were taxed much less uh, in labor costs that would increase the possibility for not-for-profit legal bodies and kind of social business models to be able to have a lot of people um, at their service who would be able to repair a lot of things which is already possible now. It's not a technological problem, it's a problem of how economy works. And of course there is also technological problems that come on top 
that sometimes there is this software thing that you cannot fix a smartphone. But the bigger part of the problem is an economic problem, that it's not profitable to repair things. Um, and of course, we need all kinds of struggles, um, anti-extractivist -extra struggles, um, where the uh, coal mining, the lignite mining appears. For example, Ende Gelände uh, did this very big anti-lignite mining struggles, and they do it all the time. They've done lately um, a very big action at the um, Kraftwerk in Schwalde, um, and I think it's very important to do this, to highlight and to talk about all these kinds of struggles coming from the local people affected by this kind of resource extractivism that is also still um, on the base of all kind of industries, whether they're called green or not. All right, we would have time for one short last question, if there is one. Yeah. I'll try to be short. Um, so in my work, I tell companies that they have to find new business models for themselves, for example, uh, leasing and lending and so on. And this Monday, I was in Hamburg on the Enviro Info, and I talked to Professor Braungart, who is one of the founders of Cradle to Cradle, and he told us that um, in the future, all the companies, um, they will not sell their products, they will sell uh, the use of the products, and all you have to know is what's inside and when will you get it back. And I, I always thought that was a great idea. Now, Andrea, you said um, this is not the future we want to live in, and I found that really very interesting because it was the first time that somebody, I, I heard somebody say that, and now I'm asking myself, am I unknowingly <laughs> helping the forces of evil because I'm promoting that uh, companies lend their stuff instead of selling it to us? What's the answer to this? Mm -hmm. How can we find a way out of that? May I? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Actually, I am thinking about this cradle-to-cradle -cradle, um, proposals for over, I think, 10 years now, and I was asking myself <laughs> the same question than you, and I would say, yes, <laughs> it's evil. <laughs> um, but not the idea of having this kind of resource cycles, like there's a very good idea in cradle to cradle, you know, in doing these products differently, in taking them back. This is very valuable. But I think we really have to decouple <laughs> that ideas from the ideas of, of corporations making their profit by lending. Um, and the, um, the other possibility to that, like where you could go in, in supporting um, corporations to find new business models is really, I think, the idea of community supported everything, or in German it's called Gemeinschaftsgetragenes Wirtschaften. There is now a, a kind of, how do you say that in English, Dachverband, like a roof association um, that is um, in the funding. It's also called Gemeinschaftsgetragenes Wirtschaften. And the idea is that you really um, produce and consume together in a kind of a Verbrauchsgemeinschaft. There is not like a market in between the consumers and the producers, but they go together like this example of community-supported agriculture. And then I think this is such a valuable kind of model that there is people who produce, I don't know, shoes, and other people who need shoes, or you can go that for everything but they are not mediated by a market, but they come together instantly. And I think there's a lot of questions still to be solved in how can this use, how can a transition be, what kind of legal bodies are the most suitable for that, and so on. We need a lot of work on all these uh, issues, but the work is starting, and I think it's very important that we go there and really think about how can we 
get to a world that is based on commoning from where we are now in little steps and also then in bigger steps in formulating from our day-to-day -day basis and see where is the boundaries to go into a more commoning direction and then ask for institutional changes and other frameworks to support that. Thank you. Um, so we're coming to a close. Uh, maybe to wrap up, I think it was really interesting to see how we have a new buzzword or relatively new buzzword of the circular economy or digital circular economy, where a lot of actors want to plant in their ideas that they already have based on the economic models behind sustainability views. Is there decoupling? Is there no decoupling? Um, so I think it was really interesting to see in the light of the circular economy debates that have been there for a long time. That is, do we really need growth? Is it uh, actually destructional in our times where we already have enough stuff, at least in the global north, isn't it more about shifting resources to where they are needed and closing circles? Um, so now I would just have a last round where everyone can say what they haven't been able to say yet. Um, and it would be nice if you could just pick one thing that we discussed or not discussed today where you say, okay, um, everything is important, but if I could change something today, um, this would be the most important thing for me. That's, um, uh, we'll see how, how difficult this task is for you. Um, and let's start with Johanna. I think that your microphone... Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's difficult one thing because it's so <laughs> complex. But I totally agree on the issue with the taxes. I think that's really crucial to think about like what we have been discussing a longer time with taxing raw materials, the use of the raw materials as well, and yeah, taxing less labor. I think that's uh, really crucial to think of a different model there. Now, really looking at what is happening in politics at the moment, something which I'm worried of a lot is the raw materials initiative. Like now, seeing... Uh, Europe seeing that they don't get access to raw materials anymore from Russia and uh, they just go to Latin America looking for more resources there. And I, re I think we really have to prevent this, that now trade agreements are used again to put pressure on countries to say, you need to give us all the resources you have in a way. Don't make any, um, put any... Uh, well, um, added value on it, but just give it, give, us, uh, give it to us as resources and really maintain yeah, this um, power uh, uh, balance as it, it is in the moment. And I think we really have to yeah, prevent that this is just written and written again into, uh, yeah, into the overall policies. And we have to yeah, take this moment now and try to get more of the uh, sufficiency and circular debate into it. Yes, uh, for me, the, um, there are two take-home messages. Uh, the first one is the recommunalization of social life, um, how we are starting to think about uh, the economy of the commons, uh, even the big challenges, as, as the questions uh, show us, um, and also uh, the relocation of our activities promoting the local production and local consumption. I'm not sure, I don't know if uh, digitalization can do that, if you can uh, produce and consume the local in terms of the material and energy. And, and to do it that and to study that, we need to combine different tools or different uh, methodologies uh, or different approaches. Maybe. Uh, one is the circular uh, uh, economy, uh, but as well the, uh, the value change of the materials and energy, and as well the life cycle. Uh, we need to know what are the whole impacts of the whole life of, uh, of what is we are producing and consuming in the digitalization. Yeah. Thank you. And I would pass over to Almut Naga now. Uh, thank you. Um, I will make it a little bit more personal um, in the sense of uh, I saw my grandmother and my grandfather who were born in 1905 and 1907 having lived through two world wars and when I saw how they 
set up their lives, be it on social interactions, but also on their material life, on their, their consumer um, activities, I think I can still learn a lot because they had their values of what is, let's say, what is worth in a life that were quite different to what we usually see in every day. So in a way, going back to an old school understanding of uh, what is important in our lives and uh, do it with less uh, materialism uh, would do us all good. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And so, Andrea. <laughs> I already said a lot, but maybe I want to um, again um, support what Almut said and go maybe a bit aside with that. I'm also always very impressed when I see what grandmothers, um, how thoughtful they are in a lot of times, or my elderly neighbors with the stuff around them. And then also I think, for me it's very important to think this old, kind of old-fashioned and maybe very future-oriented um, relation to things with ideas of being together in a more just way than it was 100 years ago, like to mix that kind of frugal approach with the ideas of the queer movement, with the ideas of feminist movements and of post-patriarchal thinking of how to relate to each other. That is for me always very interesting in so that we have a movement that is not just going back, but maybe stepping aside from this story of linear, linearity and modernity where we are in, and really trying to find another way each day from where we are. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So maybe a final wish from my side as well. Um, we've listened today to people that we don't normally hear so much in the discussion of digitalization and the digital innovations. And that is uh, people, uh, women first of all, maybe they are also underrepresented when we talk about technological solutions or how much technological solutions can actually help. But then there's also the side of not only listening to big tech companies, but also listening to um, people who work in civic organizations, who work in sustainability research and so on. So maybe one thing that we want to address as well is when we are making policies, when we are making big ideas of what could the circular economy be, it's really about who do we listen to and who gets to set the narrative. As we've, as we've also seen with, is there decoupling in circular economy or is it more a degrowth perspective? I think we find both in the literature and it's up to us who we d decide to listen to and how we want the circle economy to be. Yeah, um, so thanks a lot to our guests and um, yeah, I hope you have a good rest of the day and let's all talk if you have further questions, we are here. Um, thanks again, Amut Nagel, for joining us and um, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>